Bada bing, bada. Come on, bro. Bada bing, bada bam. Welcome to this week's Bacon a Mystery, Bacon a Murder episode. Today, we are talking about a highly requested book called Turn of the Key by Ruth Ware. This book was like highly requested since we started doing these spams, and I don't know why, I just never got into it. I guess the blurb made me feel like it was gonna be haunted house, paranormal vibe, ooh, noises in the attic, and you guys know that I am not a huge fan of reading about ghosts. It just doesn't freak me out as much. So I was really pleasantly surprised that this book is like a very smart, clever take on the haunted house trope. Like it's, it's got that haunted feeling, but it's not ghosts. It's mm. all humans. And I think that's so scary. I think that's creepier. And the whole thing is like a smart house that's out to get you. Or is it? Or is it someone? What, what, what do you mean smart house? Like everything is controlled by an app. It's like oh, a okay. super modern smart house. Oh, I like and it. Like a start, robot. Yeah. And things robot just start fucking around. Ah. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So, I mean, I think it adds to the spookiness and just the whole thing. The whole setup is spooky. It involves children. <laughs> okay, no, I'm kidding. But it does involve a lot of children. It's the idea that you go to this remote house as a residential live-in nanny to watch over these three kids, and one of them is f***ing creepy. Like, I'm not even going to lie to you. I love kids, but she's creepy if that was my kid i don't know how i would react so i really liked it go give it a read i'm gonna link it in the comments and in the description it's so good and with that being said the book opens up oh we're making oreo sushi we're attempting <laughs> to make oreo sushi and like before i hear any people be like that's not appropriate that's like some sort of culture this is like some fake american bullshit it's not even sushi. It's an Oreo cake roll. I don't know why people call it Oreo sushi. Don't be offended if you're Japanese. And we're gonna light this candle. Just really smart to light it without any plate underneath on a highly flammable cloth. <laughs> with highly flammable flowers in the background. It's a good idea. Okay, so we're making the Oreo roll. Um, he's got the recipe because I can't multitask. What's the first step, dude? First step is actually the funnest. Yeah. You just separate all the whites I into guess. the bowl. Raw dog in all the Oreo creams? Yes. <laughs> I got multiple different kinds of Oreos. I got the double stuff and I got the regular. I actually got a mega stuff, Try but yeah, I feel like the double is better. So the book opens up with a series of letters or like rough drafts of letters to a famous attorney. The first letter is titled September 3rd, 2017. Dear Mr. Wrexham, I know you don't know me, but please, please, you have to help me. The second letter, dear Mr. Wrexham, you don't know me, but you may have seen the coverage on my case in the news. The reason I'm writing to you is because, scratch that, third letter. Dear Mr. Wrexham, I hope that's the right way to address you. I've never written to an attorney before, but the first thing I have to say is, scratch the letter. So it's like someone is trying to write a letter, but it's just not working out. She doesn't really know exactly how to even start this type of letter, right? And finally, we get to the final draft of the letter that she's gonna send out to this attorney. Dear Mr. Wrexham, please help me. I didn't kill anyone. Immediately, I'm like, what the fork is going on? There's really no setup in the beginning of this book. Like, it's fascinating. Then the book is told in a series of letters to her attorney, but it doesn't feel like you're reading letters. It feels like you're with her in real time, but it's just in the preface of a letter, if that makes sense. So she tell, retells the whole story from in mm. prison, writing letters to an attorney. Does she mail it out? That's the, okay, we're getting there. Okay, okay. <laughs> so she's writing letters to her criminal defense attorney while she's in jail. And I mean, things are not going well for our main character, Rowan. She is 27 years old, by the way, just to help you really picture it. People say that she looks like Anne Hathaway if Anne Hathaway didn't have beauty treatments. Does that make sense? Like, you know how people comment, you know, like the target version of this? That's kind of what they would have commented on Rowan. Is it me? So she's yeah. the target version of Anne Hathaway. Yeah, Got but just it. to give you a picture, she kind of looks like Anne Hathaway, right? Anyway, she had recently started a job for a wealthy family. She was gonna be a live-in nanny for their three young children and their rebellious teenage daughter. Now, the rebellious teenage daughter is in boarding school, so mainly you're talking about three young kids. And Rowan was found covered in blood, and one of them was found dead. 
So the case was a pretty big deal from the get-go. I mean, you're talking about a wealthy family in a remote countryside estate. Nanny ends up covered in the blood of a young child. A young child ends up dead. I mean, it was a freaking show. So right off the get-go, Rowan is thrown in jail, and her attorney, the public defender that she was assigned, refused to even listen to her story, refused to even give her a chance. It felt like everyone just assumed that she was guilty because, well, to be fair, going into it, Rowan did have a lot of secrets. There was a reason that she found that job. There was a reason that she found this family. The public would say that she targeted this family, but she said what? that's not the case. So she's writing to this famous criminal defense attorney, Mr. Wrexham, from her prison cell. And she says that, I'm innocent. And I, I know, I know, you know, they all say that. I want to eat it. Is <gasps> that okay? <laughs> you want one with cream? That's weird. Enough with cream. What? Me too. I eat a lot of cream. Disgusting. <laughs> double stuff is good. Uh-huh. You want to double stuff somewhat? Mm. Some, okay. I know, I know. Every single person that meets you, Mr. Wrexham, says that. They're all innocent. Every single person that I've met in this prison is innocent, according to them anyway. But in my case, I swear to you, it's true. I'm writing to ask you to represent me. I know nothing of the law, but I know that my current attorney is horrible. In fact, he's the person that landed me in prison. He wouldn't let me talk to the police. I thought once he knew my story, once the police knew my story, my full story, he would tell the police everything and it would get straightened out. But in fact, he just made it so much worse. He made me look so much guiltier, saying that I had no comment at this time, no comment at this time. That's what he kept repeating. And the police kept twisting the words coming out of my mouth. But please, I am begging you. If you listen to me, you will know that I'm innocent. You just need to listen to the full story. I'm sure you already know the story. Uh, it's been all over the headlines, but in case you don't, I'm the nanny in the Ellen Court case. And Mr. Wrexham, I did not kill that child. I did not kill that child and someone out there did. And they're out there while I'm rotting in prison. I'm not supposed to be here. Or at least I wasn't supposed to be here. The women here, you know, they're kind of different. You can see it on their face. It's like another species. And, and it's not like I think that I'm better than the women in prison. It's just, I don't fit in here. There's the self-harmers. There's the ones who scream and bang their heads. There's the one that partake in gang activity. There's the ones that threaten you if you don't give them your lunch. They all look like they belong here. I didn't fit in until one day I went to the bathroom. And in the far corner, I saw this woman, another inmate. And her face was just set like stone. Her eyes were dark. Her facial features were hardened. And at first I thought, oh my God, she looks so pissed off. What is she so pissed off about? Like, I wonder what she's in here for. And then my second thought was, well, I better get going. We're bringing out the big boys, the megas. They don't even look like mega stuff. Oh, you they know? look mega to me, babe. Really? Oh yeah. I feel like they could be more stuffed. No. So anyway. My second thought was, well, I better go to a different bathroom, right? Then I realized that there was a mirror at the far end of the wall. And it was me. I was the hard set woman. That was me. I was turning into a, just another soulless woman in the system. So with that, I have 140 days to convince you to be my attorney before the trial starts. And I have decided I am going to tell you the full truth and nothing but the truth, beginning to end. And also, the stomping that you hear is intentional. This is not, this is not unprofessionalism from Stephanie Sue who is babysitting her niece right now and my mom is going crazy upstairs. No, 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 no. That two-year-old upstairs is part of the show. Because the stomping noise? Yeah, because mm -hmm. there's a creaking in the attic later. There's a stomping in the attic ah. later. There's some evil children later. So we told Sophie to stop. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. I'm setting the tone. I'm Got setting it. the vibes for you. And the beginning starts with an ad for a job. The ad read, wanted, large family seeks experienced live-in nanny. Rowan was already a nanny, so it made sense for her to be reading something like this. It's not like she was just browsing random jobs that she didn't qualify for. I mean, Okay, technically, she didn't really qualify for this job. This was like a super fancy nannying job, and all she did was work at like daycare centers. But still, the parents from this wanted ad, um, the Ellen Courts, they ran a family architectural practice called Ellen Court and Ellen Court. They lived in this beautiful remote house in the Scottish Highlands. They both work from home. 
but uh, they do have to go to trade shows every now and then. They do have out of the country houses and designs that they're working on. So they are looking for a nanny that's gonna live in their remote house, countryside home in the hills of Scotland and uh, watch their three kids. Well, if that doesn't make you wanna rethink your job choices, I don't know what does. <laughs> If you've ever wanted to be a nanny, <laughs> why do children stomp like demons? I don't know what it is. They the way they stomp really is like demon like, no? Yeah. Like horror movie level demon is coming at you, running through the woods, stomping. Anyway, so they want a nanny who can stay and grow and be close with the children. They don't want someone who's gonna come in for a couple of weeks. They want someone that's gonna stay for years. The job requirements were listed as, we are seeking an experienced nanny used to working with children of all ages from babyhood to teens. You must be practical, unflappable, and comfortable looking after children on your own. Excellent references, background check, like obviously these are all things that are a must. Clean driver's license, first aid certificate. In return, we will offer boarding, housing, all expenses paid, and a package of an additional $55,000 a year, including bonuses, use of a free car, and eight weeks of holiday. So honestly, it's a pretty banging job because you don't have to pay for rent, you don't have to pay for any of that, you just get $55,000 on top of it, and you get two months of vacation. I mean, what? So it said, please send all applications to Bill and Sandra Ellencourt from Heather Bray House in Carnbridge, Scotland. The funny thing is, Rowan, she she had the experience, so this was up her alley, but it wasn't, she wasn't even looking for a job when this came up on her Google results. She was actually looking for um, something else. It doesn't really matter what she was looking for because this fell into her lap and it was like a gift sent from above. It was perfect, almost too perfect. I mean, not just the salary, which is a pretty good start. No rent, no bills, food covered. She was getting paid that much. I mean, yeah, it was good, but it wasn't just the salary. The whole look of this whole package, the whole thing, the whole family, it just fell into her lap. And she was in the perfect position to apply. You see, Rowan's roommate was gone traveling. She had gone to, I think, India, which meant that Rowan had to pay double the rent, which normally would piss her off, but she got along well with her roommate. They met at Little Nippers. This is like a nursery. It's called Little Nippers. And basically, you're taking care of shitty babies. Literally shitty babies. So many diapers that they had to change nonstop. They're taking care of like 10 babies, 10 diapers every two to three hours. Which sounds like Rowan hates kids, but she doesn't hate kids. It's just a tough job, you know? Sometimes you gotta rant about your tough job. It's no big deal, right? But for whatever reason, if you ever rant about children, people think you're like a soulless monster. It's like you're a, a goddamn sinner out of nowhere. Like you can't even, God forbid, one of those fucking terrible twos annoys you a little bit. Mm -mm. You can't rant about it, okay? At least that's how the police are even seeing it. Anytime Rowan talked about her job after she was arrested, they would say these snide remarks like, so you don't seem to like kids all that much. You seem very frustrated, you know, having to be cooped up in the woods with four kids left with no way to let off steam, as you say. Yeah, they used it against her, but Rowan swears she's not a bad nanny. Anyway, that's now, this was then. When Rowan first saw the ad, she was spinning. I mean, it was a fabulous salary and a perfect opportunity she had to take it but that should have been the first red flag the salary was too generous it was ridiculous rowan even wondered if there had been some sort of typo that maybe one of the children's were the spawns of satan's or something like there's got to be a catch it was too good of a job but it didn't matter because the salary wasn't even the reason why she applied and if her roommate hadn't gone to india none of this would have happened so that morning, after reading the ad, Rowan called in sick to her little nipper's job and started working on her resume and getting together all the paperwork that she needed to submit all the perfect things that this family was probably looking for. Something that would convince the Allen courts that she was the person that they were looking for for a very long time. The perfect nanny. And at the end of the day, she submitted all the paperwork and now all she could do was wait. The next few days, were rough. Like, you know when you apply for a job? It's rough. Like, especially a job that you're excited about. She's sitting on pins and needles, trying and waiting and hoping that they're gonna call her back for an interview, an in-person interview. And the longer that she waited, the more Rowan realized how much she wanted this to happen. 
how much she needed this job. After six long days, Rowan finally got the email. Ping. Subject, nanny position from Sandra Ellencourt. Even just the last name Ellencourt was enough to make Rowan's heart spin and her head feel like a fucking washing machine, like she was literally spinning. It was so exciting. Her fingers were shaking so hard she could barely open the damn email. I mean, they probably didn't reach out to resumes that they were rejecting, right? That would be ruthless. That'd be fucked up. So she clicked and the email read, Hi Rowan, thanks for your application and apologies for getting back to you so late. Your resume is very impressive and we would like to invite you to interview with us. Our house is rather remote, so we are happy to cover all the travel fees and offer you a room to stay in the house overnight. You're not gonna make it back to London in one day. However, there is one thing I must be upfront about before you decide to come. We live in Heather Bray House, and since we bought the house, we have been aware of various superstitions surrounding the house. It's an old building, and it's had more than its usual number of deaths and tragedies. So for that reason, there's a lot of local tales of hauntings, and well, just to be short with it, long story short, the four nannies have resigned in the past 14 months because the house is haunted, or they claim it is. As you can imagine, it's been pretty tough for the kids and awkward for myself and my husband, professionally. I just want to be honest, and that's why we are offering a generous salary. We're hoping to find someone to commit to staying at least, at least with our family for the long term, for at least a year. If you don't feel like this is you, that's okay, just let us know. But if you do feel like this is the right fit, let us know your availability in the upcoming week. Thank you. Best wishes, Sandra. I don't know, would you still apply? Yeah. Me too. <laughs> I would apply and then I would probably be so scared I would quit. And then I would hate myself for it. But like, you know, when you need a job, you need a job. But then you get there and shit starts hitting the fan. It's a yeah. whole other story, you know? How much money is enough money to put up with ghosts? And sleep deprivation. I guess we'll see, right? So, I mean, Rowan doesn't give a about these paranormal haunted stories. I mean, she's jumping up and down. She got the interview. Yeah, there's more steps, but at least she's able to conquer the first one. So almost exactly one week after opening the email from Sandra, she ends up on a train to Scotland, doing her best impression of Rowan, the perfect nanny. Her normally bushy hair was cleaned and tied up in a ponytail. Her nails were cleaned and short. Her makeup was clean and on point. She was wearing her best approachable but responsible, fun but hardworking, professional yet not too proud to get down on my knees to clean up the f***ing vomit outfit. Rowan's stomach was doing flips on the train. She had never done anything like this before. I mean, not the nannying. Obviously, she's done that for nearly a decade, right? Nearly, actually, two decades. No, yeah, since she was 17, so a decade. Mostly in nurseries rather than in private residences, but still, right? To be fair, you know, she's putting herself out there. She's setting herself up for rejection, so yeah, she's nervous. It was terrifying. And the scary part was just how much she wanted this job. It was like this hunger that was taking over. So finally, after six hours of on the train, she, um, of motion sickness and nerves, she gets off and let me tell you, this, the appreciation of this stunning landscape. I mean, the countryside of Scotland was filled with rolling green fields, smoke blue and purple skies, mountains that were rising up from behind. I mean, it looked like the window screen, but better. Do you know what I'm talking about? Mountains and the green, I mean, it was so beautiful. There was just something that, started to swell up inside of her when she looked out the window. Hope, maybe? And in some sick, twisted kind of way, felt like she was coming home. Felt like this is where she belonged. She stepped off the train. She was lugging her big ass briefcase that she brought for just one night. She wanted to be prepared, you know? You never know how these things go. She's lugging it and waiting, and Sandra mentioned that someone would be there to pick her up. So she waited until she saw him. Well, it couldn't possibly be him, right? Because this guy was too young. 30, 35, he was also really hot in that scrubby, unshaven kind of way, you know what I mean? But it can't be him. But it was her ride, right? Because they were the only two on the platform now and he shoved his hand in his pockets and he said, Rowan Kane? Yeah, yeah, hi. Oh, I'm Jack Grant. I work for the Heather Bray house. Sandra sent me up to pick you up. Sorry, I'm five minutes late. Oh, hi, um, no, no, it's fine. 
Rowan felt kind of a little shy around this guy because he was hot. Okay, if you guys watch Handmaid's Tale, this kind of gives me the Nick vibe. You know, the driver of the house that, you know, that he, she's gonna start Yeah, like that was the vibe, okay? And my spidey senses are telling me that they're totally gonna f <laughs> He's like, can I get your bag? No, 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 it's not even that heavy. Thanks for coming out though. No need to thank me, it's my job. So you work for the Ellen Courts? For Bill and Sandra, yeah. Um, I, I'm not even sure what my job title would be. I think Bill has me down on payroll as some sort of driver, but I'm kind of like the odd job man. I think that would cover it better. I do the gardening, I fix the cars, and I run them out of the airports, and um, you're gonna be the new nanny, right? Uh, not yet. I mean, <laughs> that's the position that I'm going for, yeah, but have there been a lot of other interviewers? Two to three. You're doing much better than some of them. The first one didn't even speak English. I don't know who wrote her application for her, though. Sandra was like, that's not her. Oh. Good. I mean, good, not good for her. Good for me, I guess, <laughs> if I can say that, I suppose. Awkwardly, the two get to the parking lot and they hop into the Tesla. And, you know, Jack is like, it's a bit flashy of a car. Not my first choice, but, um, well, Bill, you'll see, he's super into technology. Oh, is he? It was such a meaningless remark, but somehow just some knowledge of the man that she was going to interview under was something, right? Anyway, Jack loads up her briefcase and she's lost in thought. And finally, he holds open the front door, or uh, the side door, after you, Rowan. And for a moment, she froze, forgetting where she was and who she was and who he was talking to. And she snapped out of her deep thought, pulled herself into the car. And listen, to some degree, Rowan knew that the Ellen Courts were wealthy, right? I mean, they're hiring a nanny, a live-in nanny. I mean, who has the funds to do that? And they're offering a generous salary to the nanny. They have an odd job man that just runs around town doing odd jobs. I mean, they must be wealthy to a degree. But it wasn't until they pulled up to Heather Bray House that Rowan realized just how freaking rich they were. It made her feel strange. She almost wanted to turn to Jack and say, Oh, I, I, I don't care about money. Like, I'm not here for the salary. Hmm? But what a strange reaction that would have been. So instead, she bit her tongue, and she watched as the high steel gate swung open when the Tesla approached. And it was eerily silent, you know, the car. They drove up the long, winding driveway. I mean, how much driveway does someone need, Jesus Christ? They were taking turns, and they still couldn't even see a house yet. Turns in a driveway. It wasn't until, you know, the house came into view that Jack noticed her reaction. Big place, isn't it? Just a bit. <laughs> And finally, there was Heather Bray House. I don't know what Rowan was expecting, maybe a mansion or something, but the house actually looked homey. It was like a Victorian house on the outside. It looked beautiful. It was grand, but not in that obnoxious way. It was grand in that homey, cozy, old money kind of way, where it's just homey enough, but you know everything inside is the highest caliber and everything you touch just feels extra refined, and this is not the house to accidentally break a boss in, you know what I mean? Like it just, it exuded warmth, luxury, and comfort. Like you know that it looks modest, but you go inside, everything's gonna be cashmere and the highest ma ma mahogany, mahogany, you know? Rowan felt bitter comparing it to her boxy, cheerless suburban home that she grew up in that was completely devoid of love and comfort or really anything. So, must be nice to grow up in a place like this. I'm gonna whip this. <laughs> okay, are you guys ready? The weather these days have been more indecisive than me, okay? Are we crying today? Is it raining today? Is it not? Make up your mind, weather. Normally I get really annoyed with weather like this, especially when we're in New York City, because when you're going out and then suddenly being hit by rain and having wet socks, you know that feeling where you've stepped into a puddle and your sock is wet, ruins the whole day. But if you got a pair of Vessies, listen, these Vessies are not even just my wet weather approved shoes. They're my any weather approved shoes because they are so freaking cute. Like, look at these pairs. They're so pretty. I will wear them when it rains, when it snows, when it's not even raining because they're so good. They're so comfortable. They're so light. You slip them on. It's a no brainer. And even in the wettest of weather, your feet will be dry. 
Puddles are no longer your enemy. You no longer have to nervously fidget around and jump over a puddle when you're crossing the street because Vessies are completely waterproof and they're made of dual climate knit material. It could be freezing outside. Then I could get on a train and it's steamy and hot, but my feet feel so comfortable. It keeps you cool in the summer, warm in the winter, and the best part is, normally when you think of like waterproof shoes, you're thinking those big clonky boots, rain boots. And you can't wear those comfortably when you're running errands. Like, yeah, maybe if you're jumping around in the rain for two seconds, but imagine everything else in life. And it's so easy to clean, throw them in the wash. It's a good investment, I swear, because you can wear them all year long. They're my go-to shoes. And right now, they're giving away a pair of socks of your choice to the first 100 shoes sold using my code SOCKSBAM. Check out their early Black Friday sale as well at Vessi.com slash BAM. If you missed a chance to get a free pair of socks, you're okay because Vessi's early Black Friday sale starts now. Get your style and size that you want now before they sell out. That's at Vessi.com slash BAM and use code SOCKSBAM to get a free pair of socks with your shoe purchase for the first 100 people. So anyways, I imagine as a nanny it might be hard to not be jealous of these kids that have no idea how privileged they are and how lucky they are to be growing up in a house like this with a fucking living nanny. But anyway, I digress. Rowan walked up to the front door and immediately things just felt off. The door was traditional, but there was no keyhole. <laughs> like there was a door knob, but the, you know like front doors, they have those massive keyholes. It's like separate from the knob and you like put it in and then you open the knob. It didn't yeah. have any of that. So it was just a small strange detail that made it feel unsettling to say the least. Like was this a fake door? Maybe she needed to go find the real door that was like on the other side of the house. She was about to turn around when something reflective caught her eye. It's almost like next to the door frame, a screen appeared. Almost a tiny screen. It was well built into the lock part of the house. You would never see it from afar. Jax, Bill's super into technology came to mind when, you know, what in the tech is this? And startling, a female voice started to come out of the screen. Rowan, hello! Rowan started looking around, some sort of camera. She didn't remember knocking, so is there some sort of motion sensor? Some camera? Is someone staring at her? How did someone even know that she was here? Uh, uh, uh hi! Yes, is this, um, Sandra? Yes, I'm just getting changed. I'll be down in 10 seconds. Sorry to keep you standing around. It's okay. And after 30 seconds, Rowan could hear a symphony of barking and the door swung open. Two big black labs shot out and started jumping all over Rowan. Sandra, the 40-something-year-old honey blonde woman, laughed and tried to chase after the two unruly dogs. But it, it was like a half-assed attempt, you know? She's like, K kids, dogs, come on now. She wasn't like really pulling them back. She was just like, hero, clut, get back in here. The dogs did not listen to her, clearly, because one of them was jamming his snout straight into Rose Crunch, which is just fucking great, because how do you be professional when a dog is sniffing your private area? Hero, stop it! Honestly, Hero, 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 stop! Sorry, she's so friendly. Do you mind dogs? No, not at all. Ro did kind of mind dogs, in the sense that she loved dogs, but she also had asthma. So her breathing was already constricting, and the dust that they were bringing up, but since Sandra was watching, Ro bent down. Good boy. <laughs> Good girl, actually. Here's the girl. Claude is the boy, their brother and sister. Oh, well then. Good girl. And after petting the slobbering dog, Ro had the instinct to wipe her palm on her skirt, but Sandra was watching, so she suppressed it, and she walked into the house. Thankfully, Jack came off to drop off Ro's suitcase and told Sandra that he was going to go fix the lawnmower now. Oh, thank you, Jack. And when he walked away, Honestly, that man is such a treasure. I don't know what we would do without him. I mean, him and Jean have been absolute rocks. It's just what makes this whole nanny situation even more unexplainable, really. Inexplicable. Ah, there we have it. The nanny situation. Four nannies quit in the past 14 months. Was the house really haunted? Sandra's bringing it up already. I mean, sure, after that email and, you know, just for general prep for the interview, Rowan did look up the house. And I mean, if you lean into the urban legends, sure, you could spook yourself out, but Ro just is not that type of girl. But even she had to admit, four nannies in 14 months? Not normal. Maybe something was going on in the house. Maybe not ghosts, maybe something else. Maybe Sandra was a difficult employer. Maybe she was one of those helicopter moms that was so f***ing annoying. Anyway, inside the house, the dogs are still running in circles and Ro could finally soak in the house. It wasn't too big. It's a nice family home. The decor, the furnishings, they were 
They were so well built, like they were comfortable, and it was clear that there was a sense of money everywhere. Everything felt tasteful. It didn't scream, I'm rich, but it screamed wealth. And it was just enough messy. There were piles of newspapers near the sofa, a child's rain boot left behind near the front door. But it was clear that this was not an ordinary home for children. There were no specks of dust on any surface. There was no dog hair gathered in the corner of the floor somewhere. Someone was coming to clean this house pretty often. Even the smell was rich. There was no smell of wet dog or old smells from last night's cooking. Everything smelled like beeswax and that woody musk. With maybe a hint of dried rose petals. I mean, it was just perfect. It's like those um, multi-million dollar celebrity homes where everyone on Architectural Digest and everyone's commenting, I love that it's actually like a home, but it's like <laughs> $10 million and you're like, what better can be a home for $10 million? Are you kidding? <laughs> You know, it's one of those homes. It's the type of house that Roe would have even built for herself had she had endless money and time. Sandra snapped Roe out of her chance and shook her hand for a proper meeting. Sandra had an awfully firm grip. It was unusually intense, okay? Um, you must be hungry, Rowan. Let me show you to your room, and then once you've changed yourself, we can get comfortable and we can have something to eat and chat about the position. Was the journey awful? Not awful, no, just slow. Um, are the children in bed then? The three youngest are Maddie is eight, Ellie is six, and the baby Petra is just 18 months. So they're all in bed and, um, oh, and you mentioned another child in the ad. It said that you had four. Ah, Rhiannon. Um, she's 14, but sh she's going on 24. She thinks she's 25, but she's... Wait, I'm so sorry. Is she 14 or 24? She's 14, but she acts like she's 25, you know? Oh. But she's at boarding school, which honestly really wasn't even our choice. There's just no high schools close enough. The nearest one is an hour drive away, and that would be too much. So the only option was boarding school. She likes it, though, even though it breaks my heart every time she leaves. Rose smiled, but she was thinking, well, if it fucking breaks your heart, why don't you just move? But instead of saying that, she politely said, oh, so I won't meet her then? No, unfortunately not. But to be honest, your time will be spent with the littles. So anyway, unfortunately, Bill, my husband, can't be here either. Oh, Ro is shocked. I mean, don't you think that a dad would want to meet the person that's going to be caring for his children? Strange. But Ro worked on contorting her face to that of sympathy and understanding. Oh, well, that's a shame. Yes, he's working. It's been a struggle, really. I have to say, with all the nannies leaving this year, the children are very upset. And the business has suffered. We're both architects in a two-man firm. It's just me and him. But that means during busy times and when we have more than one project going on, we're stretched a bit thin. We try to juggle it as best as possible, but it's just pure chaos. I've been picking up the slack at home with the recent nanny leaving and Bill's been holding down the business. I mean, I'm going to be honest. Whoever gets this position is not going to have a smooth introductory period. Normally, I like to work from home for the first month or so to ease them in, but we need to get someone on the ground ASAP. We need someone who's not going to be faced by being left with the kids right off the bat. And they need to be able to start ASAP. Do you think that describes you? Rose smiled. Definitely. I mean, you've seen my resume. Oh yes, we were both so impressed, quite frankly. It's one of the most impressive ones we've had. I mean, you tick all the boxes. The fact that you've had experience with various age groups, but anyway, ugh, I'm rambling. Let's get you to your room. Look at me chatting your ear off, if you'll follow me. So Sandra Rett led Row up a flight of curving stairs. There was this thick velvet soft carpeting that was pristinely cleaned like a carpet runner running down the stairs. For a house with three young kids, it was fucking pristine. It cushioned their steps and they turned into a long hallway. Sandra put her finger to her lips in an exaggerated shh motion, indicating that these are the rooms where the kids were sleeping in. So they slowly walked past. One room had the words, Princess Ellie and Queen Maddie. Then they turned into another hallway and a few steps that led to a slightly smaller landing, like a mini third floor, if you will. On the left was a room with the words, fuck off, keep out or you die. <laughs> That's Rhiannon's room, and um, this one, this one is yours. Well, I mean, I mean, it's where we always put the nannies, and it's where you'll be sleeping tonight. Sorry, I didn't mean to be presumptuous, Rowan. Rowan smiled. <laughs> Sandra opened the door, and at first it was dark. And then instead of looking for the switch, Sandra pulled out her phone and pressed a few buttons. And the lights lit up in the room, but it was mood lighting. A few lamps under the bed lighting, and it was really well done. 
Cool, isn't it? We do have switches, obviously. Well, we have wall panels, but this is a smart house. All the heating, the lights, and so on can be controlled all on our phones. Sandra gave a dramatic swoop on her phone and more lights came on, and then with another swoop, they all dimmed again. It's not just the lighting, though. And with a few taps, music started cascading into the room through the speakers. Oh, and there's also a voice option, but I find that a bit creepy, so I don't use it too often, but I can show you. <clears throat> Sandra raised her voice and said authoritatively, Music off. And sure enough, the music turned off. Obviously, you can control the settings from the, the panel right here. To demonstrate, Sandra leaned over on the wall and with a few clicks, the curtain swished open and then swished closed again. Well, it's, um, Ro didn't really know what to say. She wanted to say it was creepy, but that would have been rude. I know, it's a bit ridiculous, but being architects, it's a professional duty for us to try out all the cool gadgets. Anyway, I gotta stop talking. You, let me get you ready. Meet me downstairs in like 15 minutes. We can have dinner and chat. Sounds good, thank you. So after Ro was certain Sandra was gone, she sat on the bed and looked around. It was fucking exhausting. It's like the place just sucked the energy out of you. Maybe it was the fact that the house was so isolated, it just felt incredibly silent, so quiet that it made her shiver thinking about it. Like the house itself was even a bit unsettling. The more rooms she saw, the more she realized just how weird it was. The house itself was having an identity crisis. It was a weird mixture of modern and traditional, but it didn't flow well. For example, the windows were pure Victorian brass latch and slightly rippled glass panels, but the curtains in front of it were full on restoration hardware, super modern controlled shades with the click of a button. But then the furniture was more conservative, kind of like the ones that you would find at like an expensive, expensive winery, like one of those resorts, you know, in Napa Valley or something. So these architects is not doing a good job. Well, she, she found that. it was unsettling, okay. but people loved it, you know? Mm. So Ro took the time to explore the room. There were a few doors leading off to a few different things. One was a walk-in closet, the other led to a bathroom, and another one was locked. Strange, but not alarming. Anyway, the bathroom was as high-tech as the rest of the house. It took Ro a bunch of attempts to get the lighting just right in the bathroom. It was either too dim, like a nightlight, or too bright that it was disorienting, and it's like 8 p.m. right now. But the bathroom was just another moment for Ro to realize just how much she wanted this. She wanted to live here. She wanted to be in this beautiful house, this room, this gorgeous bathroom, this marble tiled shower, the super clean glass. But more than that, she wanted to be a part of this family so bad. Ro looked into the mirror to pull herself together and she noticed a look on her face, one that she was sure to make sure that Sandra never saw, the look of hunger. She knew not to look too desperate in front of potential employers, just interested, but desperation never works well with the rich. Ro reached down to grab her necklace, the one she always touched whenever she was anxious. Even as a young kid, she always touched her necklace like this. It was a cheap necklace. Her mom freaking hated it with a burning passion. Her mom would say, it's cheap rubbish. It's gonna turn your skin green. Just take it off. But Ro had been wearing it for nearly two decades now. It was a part of her. It was a silver R pendant. Ro could almost hear her mom's voice now. Not silver, silver plated. Ro knew there was no reason to take it off. It wasn't even inappropriate of a necklace. It didn't even look that cheap in her eyes. The chances that anyone would even notice it were low, but even then, maybe she was being paranoid. She took it off and put it on the nightstand. Then with a new layer of lip gloss, Ro ran downstairs to talk to Sandra to give the interview of her mother freaking life. When Ro got downstairs, she followed the smell of cooking straight into the kitchen and it was like a whole other world. It's like she was smacked. So the rest of the house was having an identity crisis, right? But it still had the main frame of the old Victorian house, like lower ceilings, crown molding everywhere. Like it was beautiful, right? The minute that she walked into the kitchen, it was like cathedral glass everything. Glass ceilings, glass walls, glass down everything. It looked like someone had just sliced the Victorian house in half and the whole back was just replaced with modern glass, aggressively oh, wow. modern. So it must be very stunning. Yeah. Wow. Like, so like a sunroom. Yeah. Oh my god. But half the house. That's stunning. Stunning, but she didn't oh like god. it. Oh really? Because it was just unsettling. Like it, it just didn't flow in her mind. It was oh. aggressively modern. I mean the con it, like the panel of the Victorian tiles and the wood just switched over to concrete. It was this strange, it was a combination of this brutalist cathedral and industrial kitchen. Even the bar stools were chrome stools. I mean, it was bizarre. Even the fridge had a screen where Sandra was talking to it. Happy, add potatoes to the shopping list. 
adding potatoes to your shopping list. Eat happy, Sandra. Ro wanted to laugh at how f***ing ridiculous this whole thing was, but she held it down. The two sat down to dig into some beef stew that Sandra made, and it tasted amazing. Again, Sandra is one of those people that seems like she can do it all, but she's also like kind of holding back a little. She's, she's comfortable and so friendly and polite, but she's also very far away. Does that make sense? Like, that's mm -hmm. the vibe I was getting. Like, even when you compliment her on her cooking, she'll say, oh, it's, it's the stove. Oh my God, this stove. We looked high and low for it. We finally got it from Italy. It, it, the stove does, you can cook anything with this stove. But it was clear that she knew her beef stew was goddamn good, okay? <laughs> anyway, during dinner, they had the regular smegular interview questions. Sandra had already reached out to her previous employers and they couldn't say enough good things about Rowan. And Rowan's like, your house is beautiful, by the way. Thank you. Heather Bray House was um, a real project. It had been totally neglected for decades, lived in by a very eccentric old man who went into a care home and then just allowed his house to fall into disrepair till his death. I mean, I'm talking dry rot everywhere, burst pipes, dodgy electrics. I mean, we really had to strip it back to the bones to completely revamp it. We really tried to bring the spirit of the house as well as creating a new one from scratch, but uh, oh, enough about us. What about yourself? Ro went on to nail every single question that she had been thrown at, exactly how she had practiced, for the past week and again on the train. Still, she could see Sandra smiling as if she was satisfied. But, it wasn't, but was it enough for her to get the job? It's hard to say. They ended their night drinking some wine, but not too much that Rowan would get her story tangled, but just enough so that she could let loose and they could really get to, quote, get to know each other. Then afterwards, they went into their respective rooms for the night, and Sandra said, I think we have everything covered. I, I wanted to ask, I was hoping that um, you could meet the little ones tomorrow, see if you click, and then Jack can drive you back to the train station if that's okay. Sounds good to me. Thank you for the delicious supper. My pleasure. Sleep well. The children are usually up by six, but there's no need for you to get up that early, unless you want to. Rose smiled and made a mental note to set the alarm for six, because even though, unless you want to, it didn't mean unless you want to, okay? Like she had to, to get this job. So she was exhausted. What do I do with this? You grind it into like a, a paste. I grind, okay. Oh, 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 it's getting thick. Yeah, that good? Oh, look at that. Wow. Look at that Oreo dough. Yeah, so you roll it flatten out into a sheet. There we go. This is so much work for an Oreo. Guys, I suggest just eating the Oreo. Wouldn't it be more swirls if I flattened the whole length of the roll? You lift it up and then roll it inside. Don't roll the plastic paper. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Tight, because it's a sushi, honey. Okay. Right? Yeah, and then bring it, open the plastic paper. Yeah, and then roll it. Yes, there we go. Wow, does it feel like a sushi? No. Okay. Oh. It's like a thong. Your thumb looks like this, honey? <laughs> so, I mean, how do you say no to that, right? Like, what the fork? Ro walked back to the stairs, and it was weird. Like, it went from skylights and modern glass-down windows to, again, low wedding cake-style frosting ceilings with crown molding everywhere. Anyway, <laughs> before Ro made it to her room, she was tempted. She stopped and opened one of the doors and saw little baby Petra sleeping in her crib. She was on her back, with her arms and legs froggy style. She had kicked off her blanket, so slowly... Ro put her blanket back on and tucked it around her, and she took a moment to stare at her before leaving the room. Listen, it was a little weird. Anyway, back in her room, Ro sets her alarm and gets started, you know, getting ready for bed. And listen, she's having a shit show of a time trying to get the freaking panel to work for the, for the lights. None of them are working. I mean, none of the buttons have any identifiable icons. They don't say anything. All of it was super hectic. So it was hard to tell what controlled what. At one point, she turned on all the lights, then turned them off, then turned on the music, turned them off, had the curtains moving back and forth. It was overly complicated. And then Ro realized that she forgot her charger at home, which meant that she was screwed tomorrow on her train ride back. Like her phone would be out of battery. So she started rummaging through the nightstands and she found that closed in the nightstand was a little piece of paper, a child's drawing, or at least it looked like it. She picked it up and inspected it. And it wasn't a work of art, no matter what the parents want to think. It wasn't a Van Gogh. It wasn't a Di D Da Vinci, I was gonna say DiCaprio. <laughs> it was a mix mash of stick figures and a thick crayon lined house, okay? It looked like a square house. And all the windows were scratched aggressively black, except there was a pale face 
peeping out of one of the windows. It honestly felt very creepy. There was no name signed. There was no way of knowing who drew this. Ro turned it over in case there was a name. There was no name, but instead there was writing on the other side. Not children's writing, adult writing. It read, to the new nanny, my name is Katya. I'm writing you this note because I wanted to tell you to please be... That's it. Please be what? Katya was the last nanny. Ro had heard that she'd lived here and slept here, and why did she feel the need to leave this note to the next nanny, and why didn't she finish her sentence? Please what? Please be kind to the children? Please be nice to the dogs? No one writes a letter like this to not finish it, and no one writes a letter like this to inform the new nanny of something so small. There was an uneasiness that started to settle in Ro's heart after reading this letter. Whatever Katya wanted to say, it was too late now. So Ro was here. She switched off the light, tried to forget the writing as she fell asleep on the comfortable bed, knowing that she would have to wake up very, very soon to meet the kids. Like the morning was harder than she imagined. Getting up, I mean, the travel made it exhausting. Her whole body felt sore. All she wanted to do, to do was lay down in this comfortable bed and pretend like this was her life. Keep snoozing. But she knew she had to get up. Literally her job depended on it. She could already hear the sound of the kids downstairs eating breakfast. So she hopped into the bathroom, smashing like one million different types of buttons to finally get the lights and the shower head right. Even the shower had presets. Straight up, you could press a button and the shower head itself will either go taller or shorter or slant differently. Everything was so tech, it was just too much. But once she got it right, the shower was incredible. She had never experienced a shower like this before in her life. I mean, it was so good. She was tempted to stay in here forever. And the only thing that drew her out of that shower was the fact that she might be able to enjoy it forever if she got the job. So she rushes downstairs in her white button down, again, looking like the perfect nanny, and immediately she spots the kids. Petra was on a high chair. Maddie was the one with dark hair. She's eight. Ellie is the one with blonde hair, and she's six. Now, it's clear that the two styles and personalities of these girls are completely different. Both of them like to mess around with their little sister, though. They had that in common. Both of them were sitting in their chairs, encouraging Petra to spoon her porridge across the room. What? They were giggling and shouting at her, do more, do more. Sandra seemed to be having a good time with her kids. She's like, stop it, girls. You're only going to encourage her more. Oh, oh my god, Rowan, you're up so early. I hope the kids didn't wake you. We're still trying to train members of the family, Ellie, to not come down before 6 AM. No, it, it's fine. I'm naturally an early riser anyway. Well, that's certainly a good talent to have in this house. <laughs> the little girl with blonde hair, Ellie, the younger one, the follower, she giggled and pointed. Petra threw her porridge again. So Ro walked over to Petra to take away the spoon and porridge, but as Ro leaned down, boom, she dodged, but not quick enough because she got hit in the chest. Woman fucking down, bro. There was porridge <laughs> dripping from her shirt, her silk blouse, her best blouse. There was a gasp and Ro had to hide the absolute fury rise up inside of her. She wanted to scream. She, her hand wanted to instinctively shoot up into the air. But she suppressed it because, you know. Also, this nanny is really giving dark side nanny vibes, no? Like, <laughs> yeah. she's got an anger problem. She's got a temper problem. But Ro kept a thin smile to show Sandra she could roll with the punches. Meanwhile, the two little girls burst out into stifled gif giggles. Oh my god, Rowan, I'm so sorry. They talk about the terrible twos, but I swear to god Petra has been auditioning for them for the past six months. Is your top okay? Sandra, don't give it a second thought. The top is going to be okay. Don't worry. It wasn't going to be okay. It was a silk blouse. It was dry clean only, her only good top, and she couldn't afford to get it dry cleaned. So there's that. Honestly, these things happen when you have kids, right? It's only porridge anyway. However, I think you've had a little much. Petra. So here we go, little miss. And maybe I'm going to take your porridge and I'll take charge in cleaning it up. Sandra, where's the mop? Oh my god, thank you so much, Rowan. It's in the utility room. Honestly, I wasn't expecting you to pitch in unpaid. This is beyond the call of duty, really. I'm just glad to help, Sandra. Ro walked past her, 
petting Petra on the head with affection that she did not feel, but she was forced to pretend. She went to the utility room, got the mop, which the utility room is interesting. It was clearly the older part of the house and it had a door that led to the outside. So it's kind of like a mud room, if you will, right? But it had this big Victorian sink, stone floor. The, the door was like that old Victorian style. Anyway, Ro was not in the mood to analyze the architecture. She was busy leaning over the sink, taking off her shirt, trying to get the stain out. And as she's standing there with her bra, the door that leads into the house opens. Hey, Sandra, I was just gonna, um, oh my God. He looks up and, you know, Jack and Ro, they make eye contact. Ro is shirtless, they both blush. Oh my God, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I, I'm so sorry, I thought, and he turned around and he fled the scene, slamming the door shut behind him. Great, another stellar moment in today's already perfect day. So Ro quickly put on her shirt and rushed to mop up Petra's porridge while Sandra made her cup a cup of coffee and a toast. So girls, I didn't get a chance to introduce you to Rowan. She's going to have a look around the house and she's come to meet you all. Say hello. So a little bit about the personalities. Petra is 18 months old, so there's not really much to give there. She's a handful. Maddie is the eldest, eight years old, and she's kind of the bitch. Like, she's the rebellious one. She's the pushy kid that likes to roll her eyes behind her parents' back. Meanwhile, Ellie is more of like the golden child. She's two years younger, but it seems like she is wrapped around her older sister's finger. Whatever Maddie wants to do, Ellie's gonna do it. Rose said hi to them, and Sandra's like, kids, why don't you guys go run upstairs, get dressed, and we can show Rowan around the grounds, yes? The kids run up. So it's just Rowan, Sandra, and Petra now. And Sandra opens up her iPad, presses a few buttons, and suddenly they're able to see into the girls' room. It was bizarre. Sure, I mean, most people had baby monitors, baby cams, but there was a camera in the girls' room, and the kids were quite old. And not only that, but once they got into the room, Sandra pressed a button, and she spoke into her iPad, Maddie, what did I say about slamming the doors? And Maddie looked up at the camera and said, sorry, mom. Ro looked at the iPad in shock. So I don't always have to run upstairs and talk to them. You know, it's very easy. Yeah, very handy. We have them all over the house, since it's a pretty big place with several floors. And Rose thinking, what the f do you mean all over the house? Like, do you mean in the room? I mean, obviously the bathroom and the guest room, that, that, that has got to be some sort of technicality and legalized stuff, right? Like you can't have cameras in there without telling people, right? Rose's mind was spinning, thinking back at everything she did last night and Cassandra was able to see it all. Sandra interrupted her deep thoughts by asking her, well, do you want a grand tour? So they went from room to room exploring the house. There was a massive library, a study, a living room, a formal living room, a casual living room, a media room, a playroom for the kids. And during the day, it was more understandable why the back of the house had been surgically dismembered and replaced with glass. I mean, the view, the view was fucking phenomenal. It was like nothing was separating you between you and nature. The glass felt like, it, it just felt like you were in the middle of the hills. I think a lot of people were shocked when we decided to do glass in this back part of the house, but trust me, if you had seen the, the way that it was before, you would understand. Ro thought about her tiny little apartment that could fit into just one of their bathrooms, and she thought, no, no, I couldn't understand. But she smiled and nodded. You're probably wondering why Ro is telling all of this to the attorney, Mr. Wrexham, in the letters. It's just that she wants Mr. Wrexham to understand the full story, right? Now, anyway, the rest of the day goes without any hiccups. I mean, they get to know each other. Maddie, again, is like the annoying one, and the rest of the kids are fine. So when it's finally time for her to get back into the car to be driven to the train station, they all say their goodbyes, and at the end, as she's about to board the car, she literally gets smacked from behind. And it's like someone's tiny arms are just strangling her. And she wiggled around to see that it was Maddie hugging her. Maddie. Maddie is the one that doesn't like people. Uh-huh. The eight-year-old. Yeah, so Ro hugged her back and whispered, Thank you for showing me your lovely house, Maddie. Goodbye. Ro thought that would make Maddie let her go, but she only hugged her harder. Don't. Maddie said, don't. Don't what? Don't go? I, I have to go, but I, I, I'll come back very soon, I hope. Maddie still didn't let go. And in fact, it felt like she was shaking. Maddie, is something wrong? Don't come here. It's not safe. What? It's not safe? Maddie, what do you mean? It's not safe. They wouldn't like it. Who? Who wouldn't like it, Maddie? 
And with that, Maddie let go of Ro and just ran back. Ro tried to shout after her, but Sandra appeared and said, Oh, don't worry, that's Maddie for you, I'm afraid. She must have really liked you, though. I'm, never, I'm sure that she's never voluntarily hugged a stranger before. Must be a first. Oh, uh, thank you. And with that, Ro left. And in the car, all Ro could think about was what Maddie mumbled after she said that. And it sounded like she said, the ghost. The ghost wouldn't like it. Weird. Maybe you know this feeling like I do, but uh, have you ever purchased a morning after pill? There's just something about it that is so uncomfortable. Like everyone is staring at you, judging you. I don't even, why is the packaging? Like it just, it feels so intense. Like the packaging feels like it's judging me. And I just wish that there was a company out there that did not make me feel like that. Because if you've ever had unprotected sex, forgotten your birth control, or maybe the condom broke, or you were just not sure, you might've thought about getting the morning after pill. Julie is here to make you feel way less judged. Julie is an FDA approved morning after pill that helps stop pregnancy before it starts. I love that Julie heavily focuses on the learning and acceptance rather than the stigma and shame. They believe that women deserve products that are easy to find, easy to take, easy to relate to, and most importantly, easy to understand. So Julie works using the same active ingredient as plan B. Essentially, Julie works by preventing or delaying your ovulation. With no egg, there's no fertilization, and therefore no pregnancy, and it's no risk to your future fertility. It's best when you take it right away or within 72 hours after unprotected sex. And you can find Julie at Walmarts across the US, or you can order online, because sometimes you just wanna have them in the house just for a friend, for you, for the future, just in case. It's legal in all 50 states and you don't need an ID, prescription, or credit card to get it. You can go to juliecare.co to learn more or find Julie at your nearest Walmart today. That's juliecare.co to learn more. Okay, listen up my hungry friends, because if you watch me, it is likely that you love a good meal. But my pickle is that I love good food, but I'm not good at cooking up good food at home. I mean, look at this video, at least, that was until Green Chef came into my life. Which side note, Green Chef is now owned by HelloFresh and I love to use both brands because we have so many mouths to feed. But my sister likes to switch between them depending on what she's feeling and there is so much to feel about Green Chef, okay? They expanded their menu from 24 to 30 weekly options and the way that you can just have vegan food one day, which is so phenomenal. You can have keto the next day. You can even order extra portions of a dish in just one click, which trust me, once you try Green Chef, you're gonna be wanting extra portions of everything. And you can swap in USDA certified organic ground beef and chicken and wild caught sockeye salmon for any meal that features chicken, beef, or salmon. There's even 10 minute lunches, so you can have low prep nutritious lunch recipes in just 10 minutes no cooking required. This is perfect for like my sister and her husband. They, they're working parents, you know, of two kids, two under two. So Green Chef literally has been saving their life. Green Chef has something for everyone. They've got keto, paleo, vegan, vegetarian, fast and fit, Mediterranean, gluten-free meals. And they even have pre-made and pre-measured dressings, sauces, spices. So you can get this crazy chef curated, delicate, explosive flavor in less time. And it's the only meal kit that's both carbon and plastic offset. They offset 100% of their carbon footprint as well as 100% of the plastic in every box. If you want those cozy home-cooked meals this holiday season, Green Chef is the way to go. Go to greenchef.com slash baking599 and use code baking599 to get $599 per meal on your first box. And your first box ships free. That's greenchef.com slash baking599 and use code baking599 to get $599 per meal on your first box and your first box ships free. Green Chef, the number one meal kit for eating well. So on the rest of the car ride, Jack filled Row in on Jean, the other employee of the house. So um, her name is Jean, she's an older woman, The local, she's a local that lives in town. Her dad is super sick, so she's his full-time caretaker. And since she's, you know, has to make a living, the Ellen Courts let her pop into the house a few times a day to do the dishes and tidy up. And honestly, it's a really good arrangement. They really trust her, she loves the kids, they've been working together for a really long time. So anyway, Ro makes it home and patiently waits for another call back. And finally, after a week, she gets a call back, she packs her f***ing bags, sets up her payroll, and off to the Ellen courts she goes. She even gets a login to the Happy app so that she has this new profile, she can control the lights, it's still complicated, she's like, who the f*** does this to their house? It seems counterproductive. But it's all going so well. Until the night before that Roe is set to depart. She just can't stop thinking about what Maddie said. About the ghosts, and then the letter from the previous nanny. But like, come on, all of it had to be bullshit. 
right? Maddie's a kid who's impressionable. She probably heard the locals talking about the haunting in the house. And besides, the other nannies, they were pretty young. They probably were annoyed of being stuck in the middle of nowhere with no clubs nearby, no people their age to socialize with, so they probably left. Ro knew she was different. She didn't care for all of that. She didn't care to party or club or anything. She knew that she had a reason to make this work. And that was all that mattered. And it wasn't even just the money. The first day Rose showed up at the house, she was able to meet the Bill Ellen Court. For a moment, she didn't even know what to say. She just stood there awkwardly. She wasn't expecting to meet him. Rowan, good to meet you at last. Sandra has told me a lot about you. You have a very impressive resume. Rowan smiled and Bill picked up her suitcase and helped her inside. Rowan nervously picked out where her necklace would be, but um, you know, she slipped it inside her shirt because she didn't want it to show. And they walked in together, and in the kitchen they all sat down, had some coffee, and Bill quizzed her on her resume and her former experience. And Ro, it was just strange. Like, she already got the job, but for some reason she just wanted to impress Bill Ellencourt. I don't know, it was strange. But the more Bill talked, the more Ro wanted to strangle him. Like, he was so profoundly annoying. He went on and on about how hard it is to hire in this remote area that they live in, how the former nannies were incompetent, about how this and that, and Ro just wanted to f***ing shake him. I mean, yeah, she knew that the Ellen Courts were successful, evident by their house, but come on, this guy with this beautiful house, wife and kids is complaining and taking it all for granted? He was just so comfortable with his privilege, like it was wild. I mean, he was so comfortable financially, emotionally, physically, in the way that most people could never dream of, yet he was so ignorant, he's really sitting there complaining about his fucking gardener? And he did it with such conviction, as if nothing in the world was as important as his own little inconsequential problems. And Sandra was gazing adoringly at his face, as if she was happy to listen to him drone on about his fucking garden for hours. And Roe was hit with the realization, the gut-punching realization, that they were selfish. He was selfish. A selfish man that never asked her a single question about her train ride here or anything that didn't pertain to her, the job or the resume. He just didn't care. I don't know what Roe was expecting meeting Bill, but I guess this is what you would most likely expect from the man who couldn't be bothered to even interview the woman who would be caring for his children alone. Anyway, Sandra Polly took notice of the drooping smile on Rose's face and took over about the kids' schedules. Their sleep schedules, their allergies. She even brought out a 300-page um, binder of rules and tidbits. Everything ranged from the list of approved foods to once-in-a-while treats to the emergency codes for things and even how to work the fucking coffee machine because it was a smart coffee machine and it had presets. It was wild, honestly. Sandra and Bill also informed Ro that Maddie would probably be the hardest because she's a bit of a handful. And then they drop the bomb that they both have a trade show that they have to attend. But only if Ro is okay with it. And it starts, well, they leave tomorrow. Meaning starting on Ro's second day, she would be alone with the children in this house as the primary caretaker for an entire week. Ro was stressed, but she felt like she had to say yes. I mean, how do you say no? What else could she do, pack her things and go back home? So she agreed said it was fine, but it wasn't fine. She just didn't know it yet. By the end of that week, one of the Ellen Court kids would be dead and Roe would be covered in their blood. Rushed away in the back of a police car. One week. One week. First week. The first Jeez. night was easy enough. Since Sandra was home, she was walking Roe through the steps, how to get the girls to bed, how to brush their teeth, help them pick up their bedtime stories, all of that. Oh, and even how to check their rooms. You know, the cameras from the app that was connected to the house. And then by the end of the night, Ro was exhausted, but she knew tomorrow was gonna to be a million times worse. She had to wake up at six and she was gonna be alone with the kids. So she's laying on the mattress and I don't know, it's like the most comfortable mattress she's ever laid on, but she was having a hard time falling asleep. The room was the perfect temperature. She could literally adjust it on her phone, on her tablet. It wasn't even being alone with the kids that made her anxious and awake. Honestly, Bill was the one that was bothering her. Before going to bed, there was a moment in the kitchen. They were sitting on the counter stools and Bill was spreading his legs. So her legs were in between his legs and he was turning towards her. So if she even opened her leg a little bit, she would be touching his leg with her thigh. It was just what? oddly intimate. And she was trying to grab water, but he poured her a glass of wine and insisted that she sit next to him. 
and he sat a little way too close. And the way that he intently watched as she brought the glass up to her lips to take a sip, it was weird. Like, it was even hard to tell how old Bill was by looking at him. Like, he could be anywhere between 40 and 60, honestly. He wore those fancy glasses that made him look like an architect. He had that salt and pepper hair. And he was now drunk, leaning over the table, saying, So who are you, Rowan Kane? <laughs> It was just one of those nasty pickup lines she had heard one too many times. And his whole vibe, his body language, it felt wrong and intimate. She tried to be casual. Uh, what do you want to know? You remind me of someone, but I can't really think of who. Film star, maybe? Do you have any famous relatives? Ugh, cringe. A tired pickup line, but Rose smiled and said, Nope, definitely not. I'm an only child, and anyway, my family is as ordinary as they can get. No Hollywood for us. Maybe it's work. Uh, anyone work in um, architecture, or architecture or anything? No. Well, you look like um, Anne Hathaway. You kind of have that look. Anne Hathaway. <laughs> okay. I mean, you're very kind, but no, that's the first time I've ever heard that comparison. Well, I feel like we've met before. I don't think so. I just feel like I would remember a face like yours. Hmm. <laughs> Rose's entire stomach scrunched into a ball, and this is when she realized Bill was one of them. He was the employer, he was the boss's husband, and worst of all, he was... Oh God, Ro can't even bring herself to say it. Her hands were shaking and she clenched her fingers so, she could, so he wouldn't see. She cleared her throat and made an excuse to leave, but Bill's legs, again, were blocking her, right? Rowan felt so sick that she excused herself and literally ran upstairs to sleep. And it was such an abrupt exit, but the thought, the thought that he was hitting on her just made her want to gag, honestly. And you know what? The situation was too perfect. There had to be some flaws. And maybe gross pervert Bill was the flaw. He was the problem. Suddenly, the supernatural stuff didn't seem so mysterious anymore. Maybe it wasn't a ghost, but a 50-year-old creepy dad who can't keep his dick in his pants that was scaring off the nannies. The same old depressing story. But still, it felt like a gut punch. Ro was certain it was going to be perfect, but it wasn't. So now she was alone in her room where she could finally be herself, the not-so-perfect nanny, and she could lay there and just relax. But as she's laying there in an unsightly position on her bed with nothing but her undergarments on, she finally decided, okay, you know what, let me turn off the lights. And when she does, she saw a tiny little blinking light in the corner. No way. Are you freaking kidding me? A smoke detector? Uh, a sensor? We don't know. Maybe a camera, perhaps. I mean, wouldn't that be illegal? An employee had a reasonable expectation to privacy, right? But still, Ro got up, dragged a chair underneath it, and put a dirty sock on top of it. Sure, it could have been a smoke detector, but at least Ro could sleep a little bit better knowing that no one could watch her through the stupid smart home app. Smart my ass, like it was the dumbest thing ever. Ro woke up, not at 6, but in the middle of the night, confused as to where she even was, or what was even going on. Then she, you know, kind of got brought back to it, and she heard this creak noise. Creak, 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 coming from right above her room. It felt slow and measured, as if someone was pacing in the attic above her. Before Ro could even turn on the lights, the footsteps stopped. She grabbed her nightgown threw it on, and went to investigate. She went out into the hallway first, looking to see if anyone was creaking around in the hallway. But she was certain it was coming from above her room. Maybe there was an attic entrance she didn't see, but instead she opened a few doors and she felt like a trespasser, and ultimately she found nothing. But the whole thing was weird. It didn't sound like a bird or a rat, and it didn't even look like there was an attic in this house or anything. So what the hell was above her? The first day alone with the kids was exactly what you would imagine. A fucking disaster. A total and utter disaster. I mean, the kids had a meltdown when Sandra left. Ellie straight up stationed herself horizontally on the driveway. She just laid down on the driveway. I mean, thank God the driveway was gated and nobody was coming back for a while because Jack had errands to run. God forbid she get run over by the silent Tesla. But it was just fucking wild. Maddie ran off into the woods behind the house. So oh. Ellie's missing. Maddie's missing. The only one that didn't run away was Petra, but it's not like she had a choice. She couldn't even walk yet. Ro tried to be casual with it. She knew the girls would come back, and she knew if she went searching high and low for them, then they would know that this tactic worked, and they would do it again. She had to play it chill. 
So in Rose's free time, she managed to go through some of the giant binder in front of her of all the things that the girls were allowed to do, what they weren't allowed to do, what TV they could watch, how much screen time. I mean, it was insane. In nearly a decade of being a nanny, Ro had never encountered anything like this before. This binder was insanity. Did the nannies leave because Sandra was so controlling? Or was Sandra just a nice mom who felt guilt about wanting to pursue a career at the same time? It was hard to say. Anyway, after enough time and the girls didn't make it home, um, Ro was confused because sure, the whole place is gated really high and it seems like a nice area where no one's gonna hop the fence or the giant gate, climb it, and try to find something to mess with. But still, it was a lot of grounds. I mean, who knows? The girls could have tripped, there could have been a wild animal, there could have been something. A pond that they could drown in? So Ro took the dogs when Petra was down for her nap and she started looking for the girls. The dogs, I don't know, she hoped that they could sniff the girls out like canine dogs, but it didn't work. So finally, Ro made it back home and she ran into this woman downstairs, maybe 50 or 60 years old. Um, hello? And she just looked at Ro with disgust and disapproval, maybe hatred. It was hard to say. Ro suddenly felt self-conscious and she looked down and she realized that two buttons on her blast had unbuttoned in her hectic craze to find the girls. She quickly buttoned them, her face was blushing. Hi, hello, um, who are you? I'm Jean, Jean McKenzie. Um, I imagine you're the nanny, Rowan? Yes, I'm the nanny, Rowan. Well, I don't know, I'm not a nanny, so I guess it's up to you, but I don't really approve of keeping children locked out, and dare I say, Mrs. Ellencourt wouldn't like it much either. Locked out? What do you mean? I found the poor girl shivering on the step in their sundresses when I came to clean. But... No, hang on a second. I didn't lock anyone out. They ran away from me. I was looking for them. I left the back door open for them. It was locked when I arrived. I mean, it must have been blown shut, but I didn't lock it. I wouldn't have locked it. It was locked when I arrived. Ro felt a flash of anger. I mean, is this f***ing lady really accusing her of lying? Maybe it came off the latch or something, but I didn't lock the girls out. Are they okay? They're having a bite in the kitchen with me. I've been keeping an eye on them. Unlike you, is what she wanted to say. Ro knew it. Sorry, that's... That's my job. Please, let me give them lunch. I've already given it to them. The poor things were ravenous. They needed something to eat. Look, Miss McKenzie, I've already explained. The girls ran away. I didn't lock them out. Maybe if they got a bit cold and scared waiting for someone to let them in, that will make them think twice about running off next time. Now, if you don't mind, I've got work to do. Ro pushed into the kitchen to see that the girls were eating pizza. Pizza was on the list of occasional treats for the girls, and it was Ro's plan to bribe them with it for dinner. <laughs> but here Jean was getting all the brownie points with the girls. F***ing fantastic. Hello, girls. <laughs> were you playing hide and seek today? Listen, I'm sorry if we started off on such a wrong day, but I feel terrible about it, and I promise tomorrow is going to be better. Can we be friends? And for a second, it looked like Ellie was wavering. She wanted to smile and put out her hand, but Maddie pinched her under the table and Ellie jerked back her hand with a whimper. It happened so fast, but Rose saw it. And she said, what just happened? Nothing. Ellie, it's okay. What just happened? You can tell me. Nothing. Maddie looked content with her actions and Ellie was emotional. It was clear which sister was in charge. And Ro was pissed, but at the same time she understood. Because imagine being left for an entire week with just this stranger that you just met yesterday. I mean, if Ro was younger, she would have behaved the exact same way. So since the kids were safely home, Ro made her rounds to arm the house essentially, meaning locking it down from the inside, which I don't know how safe that is because like, what if there's a fire and the kids can't get out? But like, that's what they did. The older doors, they had um, keys that they would keep on the top of the door frame and they would lock it from the inside. So it's locked from the inside and out, right? So you can't get in without unarming the house and you can't get out without unarming the house. And the utility room was one of the older doors that was on the first floor. So she locked it, put the key on top of the door frame. Now, here's the thing. This all sounds normal, right? And it's like, None of this is really part of the murder, but it all matters because I guess piece by piece, Ro is explaining she was just being ripped apart in this house. She was losing her mind. That night was rough. Like Maddie and Ellie refused to come down for dinner. Not even pizza or ice cream worked. They barricaded the entire door into their room with anything that they could find, pillows, cushions, toys, stuffed animals, everything. Petra had a good nap, but that night she was so cranky, I guess because her nap was so good. She just, nothing was putting her to sleep. She even read the 
you know, pardon the Bible, line, Bible length binder to tell her what to do, and none of it was working. So she put Petra back in the crib, just having her cry it out, went downstairs, and Ro realized she hadn't eaten a single thing. So she grabbed the pizza and she started heating it up. And then there was a tap, tap, tap on the glass window. She swung around thinking someone was there because it didn't sound like it was a branch, but rather a tap, tap, tap. But it was dark outside, she couldn't see a single thing. Now, I don't know why she did this, but in the panic, she yelled, lights on, and all the lights in the room turned on. I mean, it was so freaking bright, like operating room bright. And obviously, with the lights on, all Ro could see was nothing outside. She could only see her reflection, but whoever was out there could see her completely, mm. just sitting there like a sitting duck. So she panicked and screamed, lights off, and every single light in the kitchen turned off. Now it's pitch black. She bonked her way all the way to the tablet to turn on some of the mood lighting, but she was certain something was out there. Somewhat. And while her pizza was heating up, she nervously glanced outside, just feeling exposed. Every sound, every flicker, it made her paranoid. But what could she do? She can't call the police because she's paranoid, right? And then finally, a flicker in the utility room. The door swung open and a dark figure appeared. What? It's me, Jack. Oh my God, Jack, what the heck? Was that you in the back just earlier? Earlier when? Never mind. Doesn't matter. What, what can I help you with? I won't keep you long. I just wanted to check in and see if you're all right, being it's your first day and all. Thanks. Um, you can come in if you, if you want. The kids are in bed. I'm just getting myself some supper. Are you sure? It's pretty late. I'm sure. Sorry, I was meaning to come earlier, but I had some errands to run. How are the kids? It was, um, good. Yeah, good. Oh, God. <laughs> Who am I kidding? It was awful. They ran away from me after Bill and Sandra left and I went to look for them in the woods. And then that woman, what's her name, Jean? Well, she turned up, found the girls sitting on the doorstep claiming that I locked them out, which I absolutely didn't. And I deliberately left the door open for them. And they all, they all hate me. They all hate me. Petra's been screaming for like an hour. And right on cue, Petra starts screaming. Shh, sit down, it's okay, I got it. She's probably just not used to your face yet. It'll get better. So Ro watches Jack go up the stairs to Petra's room, probably broke every nannying rule, aka don't let a man be alone with a baby, unless the parents said it's okay, you know what I mean? <laughs> right? So he has access to the smart home, so she just kind of assumed, I'm sure, why would they hire someone that they're not comfortable being alone with the babies? Right? And sure enough, after some cooing, Jack came back down successful. Petra was knocked out. God, you must think I'm an idiot. I mean, that's my job, right? Don't be silly. They'll be fine once you get to know them. You're just a stranger, that's all. And they're testing you. They've had enough nannies this past year to make them a bit mistrustful, you know? You know what kids are like. Once they see that you're here to stay, they'll come around. What did happen with the other nannies, if you don't mind me asking? Sandra said that they left because they thought the house was haunted, but I just can't believe that. I don't know. It just seems wild. Have you ever seen anything? Well, I wouldn't say I... And before he could respond, a voice comes booming down from the speakers. Sandra is calling in, which is creepy. Was she watching them too? She just wanted an update on the first day. <laughs> it was weird, okay? So she's like talking into the air. I mean, it was just like this whole thing. It was weird. So they hung up and Ro felt defeated. The idea that she had to wake up back at 6 a.m. was crushing. The fact that she had to do this all over again. And the fact that Jack sat there listening to their awkward conversation. Ugh. They ate the pizza together. Ro insisted that he stay for pizza, and Jack tried to make the conversation light again. Um, about what you were asking about? Oh, the supernatural thing? Well, the truth is, I haven't seen anything myself, but Jean, well, she's not superstitious exactly, but she loves a good tale. She's always filling the kids' heads with folk tales and urban legends, you know? That sort of thing. But this house is very old, or parts of it are, anyway. There's the usual amount of deaths and violence, I suppose. So you think Jean's been telling the girls stuff and they've been passing it on to the nannies? Maybe, I wouldn't want to say for sure, but... Look, the other nannies were young. They probably just didn't like being in a remote place with no one their age to talk to. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. And after dinner, Ro helped Jack out and he gave her his cell phone number so that if she had any problems, she could just call him. But he lived literally right there. So this is their house. They had a detached garage and he lived in an apartment above the detached garage. So mm. he's like a couple- Same property. Yeah, same property, a couple steps away from the utility room. So he's mm. like right there. Now, she goes to lock the utility room door and the key is gone. Jack took it. No, but it doesn't make sense because Jack has his own set of keys. And he didn't lock it. He unlocked it with his key, put it in his pocket, 
opened the door, came in, ate dinner, and when they went to go lock it, mm-hmm. the key was gone. But Jack was already left, you know, uh-huh. the door had been closed. So she's like, what do I do? I mean, should I call him 10 minutes after? But that's so embarrassing. Uh-huh. So she starts panicking. She turns on all the lights, turns on the flashlight, trying to look underneath all of like the utility stuff to see if the key had slipped or anything, but it was gone. But it's nearly midnight. She's got to knock out. So she just barricades it with some like little pieces of furniture, hoping that it's enough because I mean, technically the whole place is gated and it's in the middle of nowhere. Like who's going to come, right? Mm -hmm. Whoever's going to come probably already has the key is her thought. So she goes back to her room and she tries to fall asleep. She sets her alarm, but she wakes up again at 3.15. So the creaking noise. Is it implying that someone's living in the attic? Kind of, or something's going on in the attic. Like a ghost ghost or someone, right? But it's like pacing. It doesn't even sound like someone is walking around casually and trying to be quiet in the attic. It sounds like creak, creak. You know what I mean? Like, why are you walking like that? Ro realized that maybe the locked door in her room was the entrance to the attic because nowhere in the house, and trust me, she searched, there was no entrance to any attic. Ro stomped over to the door and tried to pull it open with all her might, but it didn't work. She tried to use the key to the bedroom that Sandra had given her, didn't work. There was no key above the doorframe, nothing. So Ro got down on her knee and stuck her eye to the keyhole to look. And yeah, she did feel like out of nowhere, something was gonna come and stab her retina out, but she was just so curious. She couldn't see anything. But she felt something, some sort of ventilation, like air was coming out of the keyhole, which if you were looking into the keyhole of a tiny little broom closet, you wouldn't get that type of ventilation. So that means something's behind there. The attic, perhaps? The footsteps had stopped at this point, but Ro knew that she wasn't going to sleep anytime soon. So she stayed awake till her alarm clock read 5.57. Yeah, she's fucking sleep deprived. It was morning, the children were now waking up and Ro had gotten no sleep. She rushed down to make a coffee where she saw Jack gathering the dogs for their walk. Sorry, hope I didn't wake you. No, not at all. Sleep well? What did that mean? Did he know something? And then Rose like, come on, you're being paranoid. That's just a normal question that po- polite people ask. Not particularly well, actually. I couldn't find the key to the back door last night, so I couldn't lock it up properly. Do you know where it might have gone? This door? The utility room door? Yeah, there's no bolt in it either, so I just wedged a piece of wood beneath it, but clearly that didn't work because you walked in. Jack frowned and reached for the door frame to search for the key. Already, I already checked the door frame, obviously. Jack kneeled down to look, and Rose was getting annoyed, like... Come on, I'm not a f***ing idiot. Like, I already checked down there. As if I didn't look? Are you kidding? Do you think I'm dumb? The more Jack looked, the more that she was getting annoyed. Jack, I... I already looked down... Th- I already looked down... Th- Jack, did you hear me? I said I already looked. And the irritation in Ro's voice was showing. And Jack said, got it. And Jack huh. was holding up the brass key in the air. It just didn't make sense. She looked last night, she was sure of it, but now, now here it was and it didn't make sense. And honestly, it made Rose suspicious of Jack because maybe, maybe he was too nice. But maybe the key had been there all along. Maybe she was losing her mind. Maybe the lack of sleep was getting to her. Money can't buy happiness. I mean, judging from this story, we know that's true. But not worrying about your money is pretty freaking close. That's where Chime can help you smile more. They were just named the number one most loved banking app, and for good reason. With payday up to two days early and fee-free overdrafts up to $200, they offer financial peace of mind in your wallet. All of this with no annual fees, large security deposits, or credit checks to apply. See for yourself why Chime is so loved at Chime.com banking. That's Chime.com banking. Chime is a financial technology company, not a bank. Banking services and debit card provided by the Bancorp Bank or Stride Bank NA, members FDIC. Early access to direct deposit funds depends on payer. Spot me eligibility requirements and overdraft limits apply. See chime.com slash spot me. Chime was the 2021 number one most downloaded banking app in the US, according to Apptopia. But before Ro could make sense of it, she knew she had to make the girls breakfast. So this day was going better than the last, at least, right? She made plans to rally up the girls and go on a little picnic, and they agreed, shockingly. So they packed sandwiches, went out into the grounds, and um, after their little picnic, the girls asked Ro if she wanted to see their hangout spot, their secret little spot. So they lead her to this wonderful garden. The garden didn't look wonderful, and it was more of like a secret garden. So imagine four walls brick walls and it's like a room and there's a iron gate so it's almost sequestered off it's not like a garden there's just no roof imagine brick walls on all sides and an iron gate and no roof Mm -hmm. and like a greenhouse inside 
Mm. Now, there was a gate and it was supposed to be locked, but Ellie said it's fine and she unlocked it by sticking her little toddler hand in and undoing the clasp from the inside. Now, this garden was near the edge of the grounds, so Ro was skeptical about going inside with the girls because the gates were locked. But you know, if it was dangerous, she probably would have known about it and she was making so much progress with the girls. So she went in with the girls, with the stroller with Petra in it, and the whole garden felt like very different from the rest of the house. Overgrown, unkept, not organized. It felt abandoned, really. There were overgrown bushes of berries all over the place, tangled vines. There were a lot of pretty plants, but they were taken over the space. The tree limbs were hanging down, brushing past, almost reaching out at the people passing. And in the corner, amongst the overgrown foliage, was a statue of a woman. A skull-like skinny face, cheeks that were scored with what looked like scratches, and skeletal long hands, and the word said Atlas. God, what a horrible statue. Who on earth would put up something like that? Girls, where'd you go? Maddie? Ellie? Finally, after what felt like ever, the girls popped up and they started making their way back home. The whole day was relatively nice. The girls were being nice. Petra was calm. There was that nasty cut on Rose's forehead that was dampening the day. She had scraped it along one of the branches in the garden and now it was swollen and red and it was like pulsating. Maybe poison ivy. Maybe she was allergic to a plant. I don't know. It was strange. She's never had this experience before. Now that night, Sandra called and um, she has to talk to the kids. So Rowan gives the phone to the kids and she leaves the room because she wants them to have, you know, a bit of time to talk to their mom by themselves. And when Maddie comes back to the kitchen and gives Ro the phone back, she looks, there's a strange look on her face, like pride? Mommy wants to talk to you. Hello? Rowan, what's this I hear about you taking them to the locked garden? Oh, uh, well, I, I did, but how dare you force your way into an area on the grounds that we expressly keep locked for the children safely. Safety, I can't believe how irresponsible. Whoa, 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 hang on a minute, Sandra. I, I'm sorry if I made the mistake. I had no idea I was out of bounds, and I didn't force myself in anywhere. Ellie and Maddie, I told you to use your common sense. If breaking into a poison garden is your idea of common... What did you just say? It's a poison garden, as you would know if you bothered to read the binder provided, which you clearly did not. A poison? Ro grabbed her binder and frantically started flipping through the pages, all 350 pages of it. I mean, how was she supposed to read it all? Sandra should have put a poison garden near the front, for fuck's sake. What even is a poison garden? (sighs) The previous owner of the house was an analytical chemist with a specialty in biological toxins. That was his personal... Testing ground, I suppose. Every single plant is toxic to some degree, some extremely toxic, and many of them you don't need to ingest. Just even brushing past them or touching them is enough. Rose's Mm. hand shot up to the burning forehead. We're trying to find the best way to deal with it, but the bloody thing has some sort of heritage status and is protected, so we can't just tear it down. In the meantime, we keep it locked up, and it never occurred to me that you would take them there. Sandra, I apologize for that. That is 100% on me. But you should know it wasn't my idea to go. The girls suggested it, and they know how to open the lock without a key. There's some kind of clasp that they use, and they've clearly done it before. That kind of shut her up. Well, we'll talk about this when I get back. Can you put Maddie back on the phone? And just like that, it was clear why Maddie was being so nice to Ro that day. The girls had a plan. The girls talked on the phone with Sandra for a while, while Ro started Googling Atlas. The Greek goddess of death, misery, and poison. That was the statue. Fucking great. And when the girls were done talking on the phone, they were called in for dinner, and Ro asked, Girls, did you know that the plants in the garden were dangerous? What garden? The poison garden, the one that you're not supposed to go into, remember? Oh, we're not allowed to go in there without a grown-up. But you're a grown-up. Did you guys know the plants were dangerous? Did you know? And Ellie said, Another girl died. What did you say? There was another girl who died. Jean told us. A long time ago, before we were born, she was a little girl of the man that lived here before us. And that's why he went, you know, crazy. And Maddie said, that's why he went soft in the head. What do you mean soft in the head? He had to be put away, not straight away, but after a while, living here with her ghost, he lost his mind. His daughter's ghost used to wake him up in the middle of the night with her crying. And Jean told us after a while he stopped sleeping. He would just pace back and forth all day long, creaking on the floors. And he went mad. 
You know, people go mad if they stop sleeping for long enough. They go mad and then they die. Maddie, is that what you meant before when you said the ghost wouldn't like it? I don't know what you're talking about. When you hugged me the first day that I met you, you said the ghost wouldn't like it. I never hugged you. I don't hug people. Well, there aren't any ghosts, Maddie. I promise you that. They're just make-believe and they can't hurt you or me or any of us. Whatever. I'm done with dinner. And with that, Maddie ran upstairs with Ellie following behind. And when Ro went to clean up her plate, she saw that Maddie had used her alphabet spaghetti to write W-E-H-A-T-E-U. W-E-A-H? We hate you. Oh, jeez. Okay. <laughs> Ro wanted to scream. She was terrified and fucking angry. Like, you think I like you? You think I like you, you little sh I hate you too. What the heck? You're making my life miserable. Why are you so creepy? Why are you so annoying? But Ro didn't hate Maddie. Just in the moment, it felt like she did. Ro almost felt connected to Maddie. All that anger in that eight-year-old, Ro felt that when she was eight. Ro and Maddie even looked alike. Their eyes were holding dark secrets. They had brown hair and their stubbornness was this look of determination. Maddie was like Ro, a girl with a plan. But what the hell was Maddie's plan? So over the course of a few more days, more weird shit starts taking place in the house. More sleepless nights, more creaking in the attic, still unable to get into the room. I mean, she kind of low-key suspects Jack for stealing the utility room key, but there's no reason because he already has the key, unless he's doing it to drive her crazy, which wouldn't make sense either. On top of that, Maddie is still not coming around to Roe, and remember her favorite R necklace? Well, it went freaking missing. The only good thing that happened was the swollen forehead got better, but that was about it. There were some sexually charged moments where the house was having a meltdown and Jack would rush over shirtless and help save the day. They were having those exchanges, those glances, right? <laughs> Ro was able to find out some more information about all the deaths in the house. Apparently the little girl was the daughter of the doctor who was the poison chemist and she died after ingesting churro laurel berries, poisonous berries that were made into jam. But for some reason her father never ate jam so she was the only one that died and that made the locals feel like he was suspicious that the dad had wanted her to die or had poisoned the jam or didn't eat the jam because he knew it was poisoned. I'm not sure. Locals just suspect that her dad killed her. Then another family bought it and well, the dad killed the wife and the kids by drowning them in the bath. Then another owner shot himself with the rifle in the head and there's just been a lot more than the normal amount of death in the house. So with that new information, um, the girls started going to school, which was looking out for Ro because, you know, the girls were gone for most of the day and Petra was pretty easy to manage. One day when Jack was out running errands for the Ellen courts, Ellie did say something that was very suspicious. She went up to Ro and said, I like it better when he's gone. He makes them do things they don't want to do. He makes them do yeah. things, okay. So, I mean, that just made her suspicious. She tried to ask like, who are you talking about? Your dad? Jack? Is it Jack? But Ellie got scared and stopped responding. So was Jack doing something weird to them, to the children, to, to who? The nannies? Maybe she should find out because the Ellen courts weren't coming home soon. Well, they were supposed to, but another email was sent extending their trip by another week. And on top of that, they were going to have another person that she was supposed to look after. Rhiannon, the teenage girl, was coming home for the week. That should be good, though. No, it was going to... Judging by the sign on her door... Oh. Yeah, it was not going to be good. She okay. sounds like angsty teenager, right? And she really was. She was the really bratty type that treated the help like the help. She was Maddie, but worse, because she was smarter and older and more scathing. Everything she said made Ro feel like utter trash. Oh, and she liked to sneak out and get drunk with the guys. I mean, it really wasn't sneaking out, but more so, she would lie. Lie to her parents, sleep over at a guy's house, and it was clear that she was getting drunk and coming home the next day. So with all of that going on and barely three hours of sleep a night, she tells Jack, I need to do something about this door. Like, there's no way it's a bird or a rat, it's a human, it sounds like it. So he grabs a whole set of keys, takes it to the little locked door in her room, and he tries every single one of them. It takes forever. And finally, after 40 brass keys, he finds one that clicks in. But it's jammed a little, so he has to really tug and tug and tug and tug, and boom, the door opens. Wow. It was unlocked now. They opened it up, and they just saw a boarded up closet. Boarded up closet? Like boards on the wall of a closet. Okay, so they still can't get in. Yeah. But 
he's like, that's not a wall. I know it's not a wall. And the, that boarding, it doesn't look like Sandra and Bill did it because they pay attention to detail for everything. They, there's no way they would have just boarded something up with rusty nails and called it a day. So they tore down the boarding and it was a staircase going up. Yikes. They hiked up the staircase and they found an attic but this was one of the only ways up into the attic that they knew of. There was no other door, no other entrance, unless someone's like climbing through the vents or something. Uh -huh. And the attic was creepy. It was filled with feathers, not like pillow down feathers from a pillow, you know, but straight up feathers and it smelled like death. The two things were connected. A window was open a crack and two crows had flown in and tried to fly out by banging on every hard surface till all their feathers were plucked and fell to the ground. And now they were dead in a corner. Oh. On the walls were a bunch of written phrases and it looked like a child writing. It, it, was, it looked very amateur and it said, the ghosts don't like you. They hate you. We want you to go away. The ghosts are angry. They hate you. Get out. They're angry. We hate you. We hate you. Go away. Ro knew where those words came from. But how? There's no other entrance into the attic but through Ro's room. And Ro knew Maddie couldn't have been there. But she repeated those phrases to her. So does that mean someone had said it to Maddie? But that still didn't explain the creaking. None of it explained the creaking and the smell. Just thinking about the smell made Ro want to gag. The smell of death was so strong. Oh, and the dolls, there were a bunch of glass Victorian dolls just laying on top of each other, faces painted with these strange expressions. Anyway, afterwards, Jack offered Ro the only key to the storage room because, well, the door was in her bedroom and he also wanted her to figure out what they should do with it. Either board it up and act like it nothing happened or tell Bill and Sandra that they tore it down. Either way, it was a lot to think about. Ro locked the door in the meantime, meaning no one else could go up, and she was deciding what to do with it. She also started sleeping downstairs on the couch. And one morning she woke up to Ellie snuggling up with her. Ellie, what are you doing here? I had a nightmare. That's oh, okay. Ro felt like it was a moment. They were finally bonding. Except when she got up from the couch, ting, something fell to the ground. The decapitated glass head of a Victorian doll. What? Ro knew she would have never brought it down from the attic and it was locked. So what? Ro freaked out, accused Maddie or of Ellie or even pu someone putting it there and they got into this huge heated fight and Ro felt like all the effort of getting closer to the girls, it was gone now. And then after the little cold war, Ellie wrote Ro a letter. Well, it wasn't written, it was typed. But their tech with one of their tech-obsessed gadgets, it was a speech-to-text letter printer and it read, Dave Owen. Dear Owen, dear Rowan. Dave Owen, <laughs> speech to text be like that. I'm so sorry for scratching you and walking away, saying that I hate you. Please don't be angry and don't go away like the others. I'm so sorry, love, Ellie. At least Ro was getting back on good terms with Ellie again, and Maddie was no longer actively torturing her, right? Unless Maddie was the one that put the doll on the couch, but like how? Anyway, Riri was the problem now. She was going out drinking all night long, and finally, she was gonna put a stop to it. Rose like, I can't do this. I mean, I can't be her jailer. I can't force her to stay home, but it's my job to tell her parents. So she sat Riri down and Riri was like, I'm going out tonight. I don't think so. Yeah, well I do. Are you planning on walking in those heels? Because I'm not giving you a ride anywhere. I have a ride coming. Okay, Rhiannon, this is all very fun and everything, but if you go out, I'm gonna call your parents and I have to tell them that you came home stinking of alcohol when you came. Ro expected her to look scared or anything, but Nothing. In fact, she looked like she was enjoying it. I wouldn't do that if I were you. You little shit. Is that the type of language that you use at Little Nippers? Hmm? What? How did you know where I worked? No, that's, don't try to change the subject. This is unacceptable and stupid. First of all, I know you're going out drinking with your friends and I have to let your parents know. Well, I don't think you'll do that. Give me one good reason not to. I'll do better. I'll give you two good reasons. Rachel Gerhardt. The silence in the room was deafening. For a second, Rachel felt her knees buckle underneath her. This was the moment where everything goes to shit. Shit was going to hit the fan because Rhiannon knew the truth and now Bill and Sandra were going to too. And if you're confused, let me fill you in. Rachel is her real name. Rowan is her roommate that's in India. She had the better resume, the better everything, and Rachel used her information to apply for the job. I mean, yes, it was because she had the better resume, but also because Rachel couldn't... <sighs> Never mind. How did you find out? 
a little bit of digging. Unlike my dear parents, I like to do a little bit more research when a new girl turns up at the house. You'd be surprised what I can find online. It was actually pretty easy. I found Rowan Kane, and then when I got here, I knew you didn't look like Rowan. You look nothing like her. So well, I went through Rowan's friend list and, judging by your profile picture, it was easy to find out who you were, Rachel. That easy? Yeah, Rachel was too spun to, stunned to speak, and Rhiannon took it as an opportunity to walk out to go to her party. I mean, it was so brazen. Rachel didn't even know what to do. Was she supposed to call Sandra? But then what? Sorry, your kids are out underage drinking, and by the way, my name's not Rowan, it's Rachel. Sorry I used a fake name to get here and you hired me. Oh, and you don't know who I am, but I'm alone with your kids. It's not smart. Rachel knew that it was too late. Everything was gonna fall apart. So you know what? It'll probably be her last night as an auntie. Might as well drink some wine, right? She sat in the kitchen, pouring glass after glass. The girls were upstairs asleep, and there was a knock on the door. Jack wanted to see how she was doing, and he noticed that her finger was swollen. Because remember that glass doll that fell out? Yeah. Well, trying to get rid of it, she scraped her finger on it, and now it looked like there was still um, like a piece of glass in there. Oof. So he's like, come on, I gotta get those out. Like, do you have any um, Neosporin here? And she's like, no, I don't. So he's like, come to my apartment, I got you. Oh my god, here we go, finally. Rachel knows that she shouldn't have gone. Every bone in her body told her not to go. But it was gonna be five minutes, and she was gonna take the baby monitor, right? So she went to Jack's, and yes, she left the children unattended. But she thought, it's just the top of the garage, you know? It, it, it's as dangerous as taking out the trash. But the police would never let her live with this choice. In fact, they would say things like, you were so scared that you couldn't even sleep in your room. You thought there was a threat in the house, and yet, you left the kids alone? Five minutes turned much longer, because they had sex, you know, of course they did. And afterwards, there was just so much comfort in that apartment. No, no smart panels, no phones, no apps, just an Ikea couch and a light switch. And it just felt nice to be with an adult for once and not be around all this pent up energy and anger from the kids. And she felt at peace. And also Jack was telling her things. Well, I mean, all the last few nannies were leaving like butterflies. Only Holly stayed for a few years. She was the one that stayed the longest, maybe a couple years. She looked after Maddie and Ellie, and um, well, never mind that. Then Lauren stayed like eight months. The other ones didn't even last a week. Katya left in the first night. The first, first night, what night. happened? Called a taxi, left in the middle of the night, left her things. Yeah, but what happened to make her leave? I don't know. I always just thought, never mind. What? I always thought that it was Bill, maybe? Oh, fuck. okay, you don't need to say more. All the nannies were kind of on the younger side, very pretty. And I don't know, one time when one of the nannies left, Bill had a black guy, and I thought maybe one of them had punched him. Fuck. God, disgusting, okay. And Ellie's voice filled Rachel's mind. I like it better when he's gone, he makes them do things they don't want to do. Maybe she had caught on, kids are quick. Maybe she saw her dad doing things to the nannies that they didn't want to do. Oh my god, and the fact that Bill wanted to do something with her made her feel sick to her stomach. And the steamy session with Jack and every- ugh, it just made her want to gag. So Rachel rushed back home and started to type out an email on the computer to send to Bill and Sandra explaining the whole situation. But she deleted it thinking it would be better to wait to tell them in person. It seemed like um, Riri wasn't gonna rat her out, she just wanted to use it as leverage. So mm. Rachel went over to the wine bottle she nearly finished and realized it was now empty. She was certain that she finished, didn't finish it. It was next to the sink, and she looked in the sink, and there was remnants of wine all over the sink, as if someone had poured it down. And in the, in the wine mixture were berries. <gasps> Cherry laurel berries. What in the world? It doesn't make sense. This house felt like it had two faces. One face that tried to kill her, and another one that tried to save her. Someone put poison in the wine, and then it felt like someone had dumped the wine so that she wouldn't drink it. It didn't make any sense. Rachel was so fucking sick of it. Maybe it was the fact that she was getting fired soon. She suddenly felt no fear, rushed upstairs, put the key in the storage closet door, turned the key, ran up to the attic looking for more answers, more creeping. And she's like, I dare you. And in the corner, she found a new piece of evidence, a phone, a mobile phone that was buzzing on the ground and her necklace. Her necklace was there. What the fork? What? So now she was pissed. I mean, why was her necklace here? It was just gonna be another sleepless night. Rachel sat in the kitchen drinking tea, trying to make sense of it all, when Rhiannon walked into the door. Hello, Ri. And for the first time, she seemed shocked. You're drunk. I can smell it on you. Yeah, and I can smell it on you. You seem like you've been drinking wine. Fair point, but you know I can't let you get away with this, Ri. I have to call your parents. You can't act like this. What if something happened while you were out? 
Okay, you do that, Rachel. Good luck with the fallout. It doesn't matter. I'm going to tell your mom. If I lose my job, so be it. If you lose your job? If? You're delusional. You got your job with a fake name, probably with fake qualifications. For all I know, you're lucky if you don't end up getting sued. Maybe, but I'll take that risk. Go upstairs and wash your makeup off. Fuck you. You little bitch. What is wrong with you? What's wrong with me? Yes, you. All of you, actually. Why do you hate me so much? What have I ever done to you? Do you actually want to be left here all alone? Why are you such a bitch to the staff? What the fuck do you know about it? You can fuck off as far as I'm concerned. We don't want you. We don't need you. Re, I know that ever since Holly left, there's Don't you dare say her name. Don't you dare talk about that slut-faced hell witch here. Whoa. Who? Holly? Re was shaking and in tears at this point. What happened? Is it because she abandoned you guys? Abandoned us? Fuck no. She didn't abandon us. Th then what? Then what? She stole my fucking father, that's what, if you must know. What? Yes, my dear darling daddy shagged her for the better part of the two years that she was with us, and she had Maddie and Ellie so wrapped around her little finger, they were covering for the both of them, telling my mother lies. And you know the worst part is? I didn't even see it. I didn't even know until one of my friends stayed over and pointed it out. I didn't believe her at first, so I set up a nanny cam in my dad's office to see. Funny, isn't it? He can spy on all of us, but his privacy is important. And I heard them. I heard them doing it. I heard him telling Holly that he was going to leave all of us soon and be with her, that they were going to be together in London if she was just patient. I heard her begging him that she couldn't wait. She wanted it to be sooner. And she was telling him all the stuff that she wanted to do to him. All of it. I heard it all. So I framed the bitch. What? I got her in front of cameras and wound her up so hard until she hit me. And then I told her, get out or I would put this footage all over YouTube and she would never work in this country again. No, I swear to you, never in a million years would I ever, ever, ever have sex with your father, ever. You can't promise that. That's what they all think when they come here. But he keeps going, he keeps pushing, and you can't afford to lose your job, and he's got money. And you know what? He can even be kind of charming when he wants to be. No, no. Re listen, I would never, I swear, there's no way. Well, I don't believe you. He's done it before, you know, before Holly. And then he does it again and again. Rachel's heart broke for her over and over. Listen, I can promise you, I swear on my grave, I am never ever going to sleep with your father. And on the tip of Rachel's tongue, she had the reason that she desperately wanted to tell her. But she wanted to be the one to tell Bill and Sandra first. But she, she wished to God she did. Maybe that would have changed that night. But the reason that she would never sleep with Bill was because he was her father too. Let me take you back. When Rachel found the ad, it's not because she was looking for work, but because she was Googling Bill Ellencourt's name. She did that once in a while. Her biological dad, the one that completely forgot about her and didn't even care to see what she was doing. I mean, she knew who he was, you know, sometimes he paid child support. Not really. He's really wealthy, but he maybe only paid like $200 a month for the first year. Just left Rachel's mom when she was pregnant. He sent a few checks and that was it. Oh, and for her first birthday, he sent her the R necklace. And Rachel wore it every single day, and her mom would tell her, that's a cheap piece of rubbish. It's probably silver-plated. Your dad doesn't care about you. He left us. And then Rachel's mom married a new man. And their life was perfect. Except for the fact that Rachel was there. Because Rachel was a memory of her mom's past. Everything about Rachel reminded Rachel's mom of Bill. Her hair, her eyes, everything. So when Ra Rachel was old enough, she was kicked out of the house, and, um... Yeah, she did look for Bill. She practiced how she would say hi to him. And it's not like she wants him to be her dad. Not after all this happened. It's too much. But she just wanted to see what he was like. And obviously when this opportunity fell into her lap, to, it was the perfect excuse to use Rowan's name, to get to know Bill without the fear of rejection, without feeling like the stakes were high. Maybe if they got along, she could tell him the truth. And if they didn't, she could just leave. Anyway, she couldn't tell Rhi all that. So Rhi stopped crying, and both of them had this awkward moment. Rhi went back into her room, said goodnight, and Rachel went back into hers. But something was odd. She felt this chill around her, and the window was wide open. Strange. No memory of that. Did that mean someone was in the house? And it made her feel sick and panicked, and she went to Petra. Petra was in her crib, sleeping. Then she went to the girls' room. Ellie was in her bed. Maddie? Maddie, where are you? 
where the hell was Maddie? Rachel starts screaming, Maddie, where are you? Screaming so loud that Rhiannon wakes, wakes up and starts helping her search the entire house. And when the entire house turned up no sign of Maddie, they run outside and Rachel's like, I'm going to go to the poison garden. And she rounds the corner to run to the poison garden, but Rachel stopped dead in her tracks. Maddie was not in the garden. She was right under Rachel's room, in her nightgown, covered in blood. She had fallen to her death. What? Rachel threw herself onto Maddie, screaming, crying, please, please, please. She remembers not much, but she remembers Jack pulling Rhiannon inside. She'll never forget the look on Rhiannon's face as she saw her sister covered in blood. Rachel remembered crying, sobbing, while she waited for the police to come, the, the flashing blue lights. She tried to understand what the hell happened, and there she was, covered in blood, sitting on the velvet sofa, trying to explain the creaking, trying to explain the whole story. And then she remembered being taken away in the police car. And Jack was telling her, it's okay. Everything's gonna be okay, Rowan. Everything would be okay for Rowan, but not for Rachel. I would never kill Maddie. I never would have killed her. We're half sisters, but we are sisters. The police think that she came into my room and found out something. Maybe she found out that I was her half sister. Maybe she found out that I had used her fake name to get the job, but the police speculate that she found out and I opened the window and I threw her out to keep her quiet. What made me look even more guilty is the camera in my room. The only thing that could have set me free, I covered it. And now the police have a mountain of evidence against me. And once they found out who I really was, it's over. They thought I was a deranged, estranged, unhinged daughter coming to get revenge on her dad's new perfect family. But I didn't kill her. So who did? You have to help me. I didn't kill my sister. Years later, a corrections officer was cleaning one of the inmate's cells for a new inmate to come in. And they found wedged between the bed and the wall, a stack of letters. Letters that were supposed to be sent off to an attorney, but never made it. These were the letters that were found. And then another letter. It was typed and sent by Jean. Remember the lady that worked there? Oh my God, are you kidding me? Well, Jean said Ellie wanted her to send a letter, but she promised not to read it, so here's the letter. Jean said... Ellie wanted Jean to send Rachel a letter in prison. Ellie, the, the, the little daughter? Yeah. Which, side note, Mrs. Ellencourt left her husband, sold the house, took the kids to move, and uh, Mr. Ellencourt is being sued for sexual misconduct by an intern. So Bill... Yes. ...was sexually harassing all the women, and that's why they left their jobs. No ghost. The letter from Ellie read, Dave Owen, they say your real name is Rachel. Is that true? I miss you. I'm sad you're gone because it's all my fault. It's me that pushed Maddie. She was going to make you go away like the others. She took your things into the attic. She found a way in through a crawl space. She would play those videos of creaking noises to scare you through a phone on YouTube to make you lose sleep. She thought if you lost sleep, you would go mad like the doctor. She's the one that put the doll in your lap when you slept. She wanted you to leave, and when it didn't work, she put the poison berries in your wine. I poured it down the sink. And when Maddie was angry, she said she was going to get you in trouble by opening all the windows and setting off all the alarms and making it seem like you hurt her. I begged her not to do it, but she kept going and going, and she got so mad, and I was so scared that I pushed her. I didn't mean for it to happen, and I'm sorry. Please, I'm sorry. We're going away to, to a new house tomorrow. Daddy can't come, but I hope you can. I love you. Please come back soon. Love, Ellie. Mm. So it's implied that Ellie killed Maddie and Rachel stayed in jail to protect her. So she wrote all these letters to her attorney, but then she found out that Ellie did it and she never shipped the letters off. Mm. What? You're telling me a six-year-old and an eight-year-old. Be murdering each other, be homicidal. Is created what I'm this you. whole mystery. Look, yeah. Ugh. I will say, this reminds me of the Then She Was Gone book. I don't like books where in the end, uh -huh. I don't see it play out. I like to see books where yeah. it's a revelation, it plays out. This was just kind of like a letter that was thrown in. Mm. And I do. I, I think in the reading format, it is better because everything was written in a letter. But it, mm -hmm. it just didn't really pack the punch that I was waiting for. Mm -hmm. Good mystery, right? Yes. Good setup. Definitely, I'm curious, I'm confused, I wanted to know, but yeah. the answer was not as 
you know, the emotion is kind of lacking, right? Yes. Like and two people yes. fighting and then one girl pushes another girl out and then police like, it's you. Mm-hmm. And the, I think that the ending just didn't make as much sense as yeah, I would have liked there's it. Yeah, there's loopholes if you yeah, really want to dig much. into it. Yeah, exactly. And I will say that a lot of the book was a lot of children involved, like a lot of feeding the kids, and like there was a lot. So mm. it was just a lot. For someone who doesn't have kids, it was a lot. How was the reading experience, though? It was good. It was an easy read. But I, I, I would say easy in the sense that it was an easy thriller. I wasn't like pins and needles. Mm. Like sometimes I'll read a thriller and I'm almost like flipping the page faster than I'm reading because I'm like, I just, what mm. the f- is happening? Like I'm getting stressed out. I need to know. I need to know. Right. Yeah. But this one was like a very casual, easy thriller. Mm. So if you guys are just starting in the thriller space, this is a really good one. And I know Ruth Ware has some really intense thrillers that maybe we'll get into. <laughs> about this one <gasps> mm, Whoa, it's beautiful that is cool <sighs> wow. wow okay look at that are you ready yeah get you one and maybe it'll be like ice cream it looks like ice cream yeah though. now it looks like something you get at cold stone it looks good mm, so sweet Mm-hmm. Oh my god, my, cream. my tooth is doing that thing when it's something that's so sweet. But it's kind of like. It's kind of a vibe. Imagine this with some like mm-hmm. other ice creams. More sweet. Even more sweet, yeah. This is the stuff that I cannot give to Sophie unless we want to die the rest of the day. See, you want it to be not too sweet. Yeah, but then it's way too sweet now. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Someone hide this from that child because if she gets a sugar high. <sighs> I'm Rowan. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) I hope you guys enjoyed. I'll see you guys next week. Bye.